Good morning, Holland Haven family. This is After Dawn, the show where we sit down to have a cup of coffee with the cast, crew, and creators behind the Holland Haven Studios productions. I'm Virons, and today I'm joined by my co-host, BP. Yes, hello, uh, I'm BP, and today we're talking about Harsh Static Episode 4, Assault the Vault. Uh, in our latest episode, they set out uh, to Vault 25 and encountered an array of dangers from early era synths to turrets to protectrons and finally Dr. Testridge. Scribe Portnoy made a brief trip to the afterlife after saving Maisie and Knight Arthur nearly kicked the bucket before taking out a protectron in retaliation. I felt there was a lot of really interesting mechanical challenges um, in this episode. You don't we don't get to see a lot of heavy, heavy combat sessions in a lot of uh, HHS shows that we tend to be uh, a little more uh, into having everybody talk at each other for a long time. <laughs> um, so it was interesting getting to see like the different layers of challenges and mechanical, uh, mechanical points where uh, the system really got to shine and different characters got to step in and kind of do the thing that they were good at from EMPs to to hacking the vault security systems to uh you know getting into robo docs and things like that um all while having to deal with a crazy not quite human not quite robot doctor guy who was really creepy and likes to kick puppies and we don't I don't approve uh but my opinion is not the only one here what were your thoughts Virens? Well, BP, my feelings very much echo your own. I was very upset when they kicked the puppy, but we're not the only ones here today. Today, we are joined by Adariel, Solomon, and Termite. Hello, Hello. everyone. Hello. Hello. Oh. Now, I, I got to ask, what was everyone's final thoughts as you were gearing up, like doing the final gearing up at the beginning of the episode to break into the vault? I think uh, for my part playing Carter, it was, I hope I don't have to kill a whole bunch of giant robots just with a handgun because that's a really losing proposition. <laughs> uh, I hope that I can do something to distract them while Macy chucks EMP grenades and hopefully my armor will be sufficient for the task at hand. While Chanel chucks EMP grenades? Sorry, yes, while Chanel it would be really impressive okay. if Maisie could. We all have Maisie on the brain. Uh, she's the the best girl. And she, <laughs> she is the smartest yeah. and the most explosive. Yep. Chanel's just along for the ride. She got punched <laughs> by a robot man. Maisie really does all of the work. <laughs> Chanel just takes all the credit and opens the yeah. cans of dog food. Chanel's only around because she has thumbs. <laughs> right. <laughs> really, it really is just for the dog food, and that's it. Um, I'll be honest, I was prepared for things to go way worse than they did. I was expecting there to be a lot more defenses in the vault that we'd have to get through. Uh, and I'm pleasantly surprised that we didn't just get filled with laser holes, because that's where I thought it was going. <laughs> There were moments where I was really worried for you guys uh, when Saul was kind of talking about some of the things that you were or that you could see. And when you guys were talking about things that you were preparing for, I was like, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Um, got got a little nervous, but you guys you guys handled it remarkably well. You did a really good job of making sure that you played to everybody's strengths and uh, set yourselves up well so that, uh, you know. Uh, Carter could be distracting and, 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 you know, demonstrate and flex those I know vault tech muscles. Um, and uh, Chanel could just be a problem for anything robotic or vaguely structural by blowing everything up. Um, Dr. Hoffman and, and the, the Knights could all be really interesting and, and, and be like a really good, like backup force. And Iris could be, um, a sleep paralysis demon who just disappears. Never. And reappears never. whenever she wants. And that's <laughs> not, that's not unsettling to me at all. It's fun. It's also it, definitely not a pattern that I've noticed in termites. Character I would character. never. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I would love to know what your thoughts uh, were on um, Dr. Testridge himself and like the mechanics and how that fight went and getting to have Scott in the seat as the big bad, but not the GM for once. I, I for one thought it was great because I haven't really talked to Scott a whole lot. I'm, I'm familiar with him from listening to recordings and seeing the Twitch broadcast, but I don't, I don't know him personally, and I thought that he did a great job of hamming it up, combined with the fact that the fight was very much in keeping with classic isometric fallout boss fights, where it's like, here is an enormous problem. You can solve this problem by blasting it if you so choose, but there are also ways to avoid this problem, uh, or at least not blast it quite so much, and I appreciated that a great deal. Or at the very least, having fewer things blasting you. You know, like all the damn turrets. Yeah, or the there are a lot of turrets. Yeah. Um, I... Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Um, I, I'm i curious uh, what the other arm was supposed to do that Iris destroyed turn one. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that was just going to deal uh, even more damage if he had access to both arms for swinging at you because of it. the Assaultron actually had really good unarmed uh, strength. Oh, neat. Great. Hooray for none of death. that. An extra dose of death. Awesome. It's all death all the time. That is how we do it here at HHS. That is, that is our special. It's true. Now... I'm I'm gonna ask this of everyone. If you had won meal ticket Marty's loyalty program, what pie would you have wanted it to be? <laughs> Sorry, that's just a fantastic question. Um, Egg latte. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, that's fair. It's a great question. Oh, honestly, I think uh I think Carter would totally be down with something totally ridiculous, like a strawberry and whipped cream pie or something like that. That's just because there's a zero way of getting that um, in a vault or out in the wasteland under ordinary circumstances. It's a, and a it, very it like so, movie thing to ask. And, and it, yeah, it's like the, the sort of visual that you'd get out of um, Better Homes and Gardens circa 1958 or something. I could see that. Um, I, as a player, uh, a pecan pie because I mean, it's, I, good. it's good. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> That's all there is to it. We are here for the big noms. Um, I think I would want. Ooh. Probably a like a German apple pie. Um, that does sound good. I get uh, vanilla ice cream on the mood. Might be slightly irradiated because he's working with Brahmin milk. Mm, yeah. Well, Ew. There's milk in most pies, so I'm not the only one who would get something slightly irradiated. Yeah. So. <laughs> Smidgen. I mean, I I know it's definitely not possible in, in Fallout, but I would go for like a lemon meringue pie. I can see that. Never say never. Where there is a will, there are lemons. Well, there, there's now snow in the Mojave, so, you know. Uh, in the middle of August. In the might not August. be that far-fetched to get lemons. Who, the, who knows? Solomon just out here casually uh, wrecking the rules of nature. Yeah, what's next? It starts raining lemons. You're gonna burn your house down with the lemons, no. <laughs> I'm going to burn your house down with the lemons. Okay. Uh ba -ba 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 -ba. what do you guys think? What did you guys think of like the big reveal at the end? With snow in the Mojave and mysterious black figures running toward an SOS signal the testridge sent out, like how uh what, what what are you guys thinking 
How nervous does that make you? Oh, well, you know. <laughs> Please elaborate on you know. <laughs> Uh, well, considering I have uh, an idea who those figures in black are after, yeah, it's fine. I'll be fine. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. What what could fine. possibly go wrong? Everything's fine. Everything is, in fact, <laughs> not fine. Nothing is fine. <laughs> Just the, the, the narrator voice. Everything was, in <laughs> fact, not fine. That's correct. Yeah, I should point out that... Um... I don't know what to think because I haven't played a Fallout video game after Fallout 3. So I don't know since that's outside the realm of my early Fallout lore encyclopedia brain. Uh, so I, I look forward to finding out. Oh, you're just as clueless as Carter is going to be. Then. <laughs> yes, and it's lovely. It would make me nervous, but, you know, that's me. <laughs> I, unfortunately, uh, am as clueless as Iris is, which is not at all. <laughs> which is stressing me out. <laughs> <laughs> how does it feel? How does it feel to know what the threat is, but know that your character does not know that it's coming? Well... Uh, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. This is fine. This is fine. Uh, to be fair, Iris does basically have, like, the sword of Damocles just hanging over her at all times. Yeah. Um, just, you know, now there are, in fact, actually coursers coming after her. Yeah. Which before there probably weren't. But, you know, it's fine. You are not the only person who tends to play characters similar to that. Was she just walking around with the Sword of Damocles over their head? You don't say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, really? Hmm, really? Adar Adariel is a fellow PC at a game where I have a character just like that. So. Oh, I've heard. That's <laughs> yeah. Just the eye of the storm. Oh, God, that's so funny. Now, I have a very important question to ask both of you, Termite and, our, uh, and uh, Dariel. We the this most last... important question. The most, impo most important question. Nuka-Cola or Sunset Sarsaparilla? That's always got to be Nuka-Cola. No Nuka question. Cola. I will As... get into an argument with both of the other people about this. Because um, they both like... said Sunset Sarsaparilla. I don't like Sarsaparilla. You know, I I've had sarsaparilla and I've I've enjoyed it, but I feel like if if we're going for what's iconic and what's sort of representative of the world, you got to go Nuka Cola because it's like it's the equivalent of like 1950s America, Coca Cola or Dr Pepper. Get out of here, Dr Pepper! You weren't invited. Yeah, pretty much. Dr Pepper's so good, though. You know, I do actually have some 1950 bottles of cola, of like, you know, Coca-Cola. That's neat. Yeah. That is neat. Um, I would like to know Saul's answer. My personal answer is, uh, given the setting... Normally, I would go for Nuka Cola, but uh, given the setting, I gotta help out Sunset Sarsaparilla because Nuka Cola's business practices included like literal highway robbery. So, yeah, I mean, Coca Cola's business practices included basically putting cocaine in their soda. So, yeah, but that True. was at a time where like everybody kind of agreed that cocaine was cool. It was before we'd all caught on to the fact that it was not so cool. Exactly. Someone, someone should inform Hollywood. I believe that they still think cocaine is cool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we're going to be able to change their minds. I yeah, don't we've think just they're... we've just given up on that. I so don't think they're the only ones that you know still think cocaine is cool. No, that's fair. All right. Uh, I would like to know if either of you had like. So let's just play with some hypotheticals here. 
let's say you guys went into this uh, episode knowing that there were going to be future episodes and your characters died. What are your backup characters? Oh, that's easy. I got one already. I made a character for Solomon for a different setting that I just sort of fell down on on keeping up with because it was play by post. But it was a guy named Silas, who is a wandering tradesman in the Mojave, um, whose whole goal is to set up a nice, pleasant town where people can live and invest in things like dams and water purification plants and open up a pleasant hotel where people can vacation. (laughs) However, I did not pursue that character for this game because he was all about barter, speech, survival in the wasteland, stuff that Chanel had uh, sort of unlocked. Right. Chanel really does have like talking to people. Uh, that that yeah, she's, market she's pretty cornered. <laughs> uh, I would either play just a whole ass robot, um, oh, or super mutant. You know the all super. Right. Mutant, I like the super mutant answer because I was thinking about that when we were we were all piled in the truck. Just sort of, I had this mental image of a super mutant hanging out in the back with like. Uh, a big 50 cal or something but being kind of an erudite super mutant but who couldn't physically form words so they would talk kind of slow but they would be able to say things like that is illogical sir i just (laughs) stand there and it would make sense because in the because the west coast super mutants are actually capable of forming full sentences where the east coast ones are biggin basically yep I, i miss biggin why would you do that to me? Why would you hurt me? <laughs> You're the one that brought it up before in an earlier episode. True. Makes me sad. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> I think it's about time that we transition to drinking our cups, where we ask questions about the characters instead of just the players. Mm-hmm. Now, we know there's going to be more Fallout and HH- HHS's future. Are we going to be seeing the same characters or are we going to try to get some newer ones in? Any thoughts or opinions? I kind of feel like that's a question for Solomon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It is. (laughs) I mean, I would very much like to continue on with the characters at hand, though I do also plan to expand the Mojave a lot more for them to go to whole lot more locations to see more fun people as well as to possibly see some fun people played by uh some SBCs here Ooh. on top of possibly having one other uh person join our intrepid survivors to aid in their uh work across the mojave fifth cast well. member dr testerich <laughs> <laughs> so uh I suppose that now transitions the question over to you two. If you two come on uh, for, you know, a full season, are you going to want to bring your characters or do you want to play something different? Uh, oh, I would. Yeah, go ahead. I would absolutely continue playing Iris. Yeah, I think Iris is a is a strong component in terms of the weirdness of what's going on and is in a fairly unique position to to know more than others for my part i would i would almost certainly keep playing carter just because it gives me an excuse to dress ridiculous on camera i do love your outfit for carter it's it's just my favorite (laughs) true facts i was wearing that outfit this weekend in san diego that's awesome fun i'm proud of you All right. Uh, With what we know, um, or we know that Carter's knowledge about the world is kind of all based upon the movies he's watched when he was in the vault. So with that in mind, what are like the things he's seen in movies that he most dreams about seeing happen in real life? And what are the things he definitely never wants to see? Uh, 
he certainly has been let down by the lack of mood lighting and soft focus in the real world, especially when somebody attractive walks into the room or is mm. spotted. There is also a, he, there's also a severe problem with reality in that it does not include a soundtrack. Um, even just, you know, auditory stings like a harmonica when somebody, you know, steps over a dune in the distance should by all rights be there, but reality has let him down. But there's a lot of things from the old world that that he wanted to see, but, you know, the the reality of the wasteland is that bustling cities are perhaps a lot more like a Western than they are like a film noir f- film. So he's had to adjust his his expectations to be more like uh the searchers and shane rather than the maltese falcon but the things that he is absolutely does not want to see and has seen things that are too close for are all of the sci-fi horror b-movie tropes because rad scorpions those are straight out of a drive-in but he has yet to meet any aliens that will suck your brain out of your ears or eyeballs with their ray guns and that would be good to not see nor has he seen any zomp well, I guess ghouls kind of count, but they're people. Zombies, mummies, vampires, or werewolves. I mean, it. I feel like it is very reasonable to be... Uh, um, relieved <laughs> that he has not run into anything overtly supernatural. <laughs> It it is it, it, in my brain's place of like his first meeting with a ghoul. It was definitely like, oh my god, it's coming to eat my brains, and the ghoul's just like, ah, all I wanted to do was cook a, an iguana. Oh geez, it talks. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, so long as Carter doesn't have some sort of irrational fear about robots replacing people, we'll be fine. I think I think that just from the evolution of. B movies, you're in luck because all of those movies um, tended to come out later. I mean, there were like the communist theme of like pod people replacing humans, but robots replacing people are too modern for Fallout. Oh, good. Well, you know what? That... Like, I'm gonna make a note. <laughs> yeah, you know, and that actually brings us to like our next question: How does Iris feel about being a synth when she's spending so much time around nonsense and people who really don't even know what a synth is? Um, spending time around people that don't know what a synth is is probably one of the best things that's happened to her. Um, because you know. People are usually scared of them uh, because those of them, the people that know about them, uh, know about the Institute. And the Institute's kind of usually really bad news, uh, as we've seen. Yeah. Um, so, you know, being away from all of that uh, has been a, a level of relief that she doesn't get very often. Because she doesn't have to constantly worry about, like, okay, well, if anybody finds out this one thing, they're probably just going to try to kill me. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Uh, so I think at this point we are going to transition over to the Spilling the Tea segment. Uh, This section is free form with questions tailored towards the what the fuck moments of the episode, controversies and rumors, hints of love interests, etc. In this section, we'll invite the guests to ask each other any pressing hard questions they might have or to ask questions of us as the interviewers. So you're up, you guys. Yeah, I I mean, honestly, I'm I'm going to ask because uh, I one of my notes that I, I was sort of planning to ask about, but also not really because I thought it was just a little too weird. Uh, what was up with the brain and the pneumatic tube? <laughs> <laughs> that's, everybody knows that's the best way to transport a brain from a human body into a robot. It's <laughs> certainly the pulpiest, which I think, which is what I was more going for. Because uh, the whole thing was that uh, 
the actual physical surgery had to be done at an auto dock, which is what the test, which is human body was in. And then the brain had to be transported safely into a robo brain case, which was what the pneumatic uh, tube was for to connect to where the recharging station for the assault tron body was waiting. Of course, since Dr. Testers didn't have all the uh, medical like com- compounds he needed and all of the knowledge about how to actually do this, uh, it didn't turn out so well, which is why he said everything tasted like copper. Ah, it was it was things like what? Uh, like, why did why did I leave my f- ability to feel pain on or like, why does everything taste like batteries? That kind of thing, because he it wasn't a perfect transition. Yeah, that definitely, that definitely wasn't from the damage of his brain being forced through a pneumatic tube. Nah. <laughs> never, never. Uh, I have a question. So, it was Knight Arthur who was crushing on Chanel, correct? Yes. Yep. Uh, Solomon? Uh-huh. What was going through your brain when you nearly killed uh chanel's love interest how could you do that oh i could or, or, uh, very... or was it you having a i'm right here moment oh no and, i could <laughs> finally getting to like take it out on somebody <laughs> look i designed that character to already ha- have a crush on uh chanel because i just thought it would be kind of funny just for her to play up the whole uh black widow perk that she took mm-hmm. which gives bonuses to uh interactions with p pe- people of the opposite sex, but also de- ex- deals extra damage for shits and giggles. But uh, when I went ahead and had him almost die, I thought it would be, I thought one, it would be uh, interesting to see how she reacts to this guy she just met who had a crush on her, almost kicking the bucket real hard. And two, it would also get, uh, give a little bit more of the character moments for seeing how everyone reacted to these two knights who are of a of a group that one member is part of, one member is very vehemently against, and the other two are neutral towards. Seeing how they would react to try to save them or possibly let them die, I I wanted to see more character moments even in the middle of a fight. I thought that, that would be a really good way to do that. Also, the dice just weren't on his side. <laughs> That's fair. Sometimes bad stuff happens to good people. Exactly. I think I felt worse for Portnoy out of everybody. Like, yeah, Arthur Knight Arthur nearly dying was was sad and a little scary. But Portnoy dying was like genuinely kind of heartbreaking because he's just been this sweet old man the whole time. And I was just like, oh, I'm not. I don't know how I feel about this. Well, that's the whole thing is that everyone expects Fallout to be happy and cheery and funny, and it can be, but it can also be very serious. It's it's all meant to sort of juxtapose each other as a and make more a more balanced and more in, interesting story as opposed to just being slapstick the entire time. But here's the thing. If he had died, then we'd have a set of power on it. It's true. I mean, it's not like he couldn't have just popped a bullet in the back of the skull. <laughs> It's a very Iris That's answer. Old beast. <laughs> Boy. So, uh, so, far as, oh, go ahead. Uh, so far as Iris is concerned, they aren't trying to kill her, though they even though they know what she is. So she's not gonna try to kill that. I mean, it's right not like now. they would really know what she, what she is because the West exactly. Coast uh, don't know what the hell synths are. Exactly. And we're gonna hopefully keep it that way. Uh, until somebody needs to die. Yeah, the the Brotherhood's an interesting nut to crack if you're not intimately familiar with them, because there's so much of them is just like, well, they're weirdos that live in holes in the ground. <laughs> and, gr- yeah. and slurp up technology like it's noodles. Like, they'll bust into your house and steal your coffee maker if they figured out you have one that works. I have a question. What's the Brotherhood's stance on Mr. Handy? I mean, I don't think they really have problems with robots as a whole. It's just, they, it's, it's all just tech to them. I meant more in case, in terms of, like, do they break Mr. Handy's down for their components or do they leave them whole? 
Uh, my guess is that I, I generally assume that they just leave robots whole because they they figure if nothing else, that's more uh, workforce or more protection that they don't have to risk their knights or scribes for. Fair enough. Especially given Elder McNamara's uh, want to generally keep people safe, which is why he, uh, in Fallout New Vegas, he ordered a lockdown the moment that he saw things weren't going their way. So he kept everyone from going outside to make sure that no one died. Well, all right. Question. Uh, Answer. For everybody. I would like to know who your favorite SPC is, and Maisie doesn't count. Oh, it's like cop out if I say Marty. <laughs> no, no, absolutely no, not. not. Marty, Marty is, is a my answer. Contender. Yeah, Marty's a strong <laughs> fucking contender. <laughs> Meal ticket Marty was one hundred percent my favorite character. Adario. I'm thinking because I I don't want to answer Meal Ticket Marty because we, although I do agree Meal Ticket Mar Marty is phenomenal. <laughs> um, I think a a close number two for me is Goris, just because I have always loved Goris as a character in Fallout Two. Um, and for people that are not aware, he is like a pre-existing character from the games. And he was a dude that I kept in my party whenever possible. And it would not get him killed to the same level that most people would keep, like, say, dog meat in their party. Okay. Solomon, who is your favorite character to portray? Uh, I really enjoyed portraying Meal Ticket Marty because he's just so fucking goofy. <laughs> uh, it was fun portraying uh, Scrap Portnoy as this kind of sad, but also kind of uh, really like wanting to help like old man who has who is pushing himself to do things, even though he knows he shouldn't. And I wanted to see how people react to that. If they're like, oh, he's too, he's dumb for doing this because he's old or, oh, he's just trying his best. I wanted to get, uh, basically do like a, uh, a check against everyone to see what they're feeling and what, and more about their characters just to react to something, something simple. Casual, casually vibe checking the group by throwing an old man at them. Yes. Uh, but my actual favorite to portray was Meal Tick and Marty. Also, because I had actually pulled Meal Tick and Marty from my previous experience with uh, the Fallout 2D20 system, he was the first ever character I made and played for a little while before I had to uh, abandon ship on that game because it fell apart. Ah. Oh. And I thought it would just be funny to have him uh, having trekked all the way from like the Commonwealth to the Mojave in the in the search of new ingredients to use for Nuka-Cola or Nuka-Cola based meals. I love that. He now here's, cool. here's the real question. Has Iris ever encountered meal ticket Marty before? Probably not. Cause he's one Nukatron in the entirety of the United States. If she's been to Nuka world, she's probably in, in uh, encountered Nukatrons before, but probably not meal ticket Marty himself. All right, <laughs> because he went from Nuka World to uh, what remains of New York City and then trekked across to the Mojave. OK. All right, Solomon, right here, right now, do we get a guarantee that Meal Ticket Marty is going to show up again? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we fucking better. <laughs> there's there's still so many more ingredients for him to utilize, like Mojave uh, agave and jalapeno and such that he can use to make new meals. Plus. I mean, he's the, one of the better like chefs and re uh, reliable sources of various flavors and effects from Nuka Colas because there are a lot of different flavors of Nuka Cola they got introduced in the Nuka World DLC for Fallout Four that I plan on statting out. <laughs> oh boy! I, I need to send you as the GM a copy of a book that I have on my bookshelf, which is Cooking with Coca-Cola, which was produced by the Coca-Cola company. That is a cookbook, every recipe of which uses Coke. 
Perfect. I'm pretty sure I could find the Mountain Dew cookbook they did not too long ago. There's also just straight up a cookbook for uh, Fallout, so I'm going to have to try to see if I can't yeah. get a copy of that. Good lord. Really, let's like just the- find... Let's just find all the weird cookbooks we can and send them to Solomon for meal ticket, Marty. Yes, I'm going to become the next B. Dylan Hollis. <laughs> <laughs> well, what cracks me up is that we talk about this, but I, I, I know for a fact that Legacy has made characters where looking up random uh, recipes is just like a feature of the character. Oh, just yeah. a feature. Oh, I know. I'm fully Which aware. Just, where they would just show up to sessions with entire entire lists of recipes ready to go for this character to use. So, my how the turns have tabled. Yeah, no kidding. Does anybody else have any questions? For each other or for us? I actually have a a question for my players. Were there any uh, particular sorts of things you were hoping to find with scavenging or with, to grab from uh, any, of the, any of the various threats that you face? Any sorts of like maybe weapon upgrades or different types of gear? Anything that you wanted to find? Or are your characters pretty much sat it out and kit it out as you want? Um, aside from wanting a suppressor from my gun, which is gonna require us to be at least level six, I think. Uh, I think I'm. I think I'm good to go, unless you somehow let me put a fifty cal receiver on it. Oh no! Where would Jesus. you get the bullets? Wow! Don't worry about it. <laughs> I mean, the, I mean the gun runners. That's fair. They take care of anything that slings lead, really. I don't think that Carter needs a whole lot or like really wants a whole lot other than what he's already got. I can foresee over time him slowly changing out his outfit for like combat armor or a reinforced leather jacket because what he's wearing can only last so long. But I kind of like the idea of doing so, but leaving the hat. (laughs) I will. I will eventually have to get more shadowed leather armor, though just to make Solomon's life even more of a problem uh, when I'm left alone in the darkness. That sounds about right. Are we going to see more of the giant hooded Deathclaw guy? It's entirely possible. People can go and visit him, but he doesn't really do too much like in the field anymore. I think since he, especially he's gotten used to adventuring uh, from like 40 years ago when he adventured with the chosen one, which was the uh, main character from Fallout 2. But uh, I can imagine he still probably gets around a little bit and is willing to uh, accept visitors. Well, he already had some visitors, so I would hope that he's willing to accept to accept them again. Yes. He's just developed a sudden rude complex and he's like, no, go away. Fuck off. To self make friends with the death. He's 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 the the um, fallout version of Miracle Max. Yeah, kind of. Except, you know, giant and vicious. As opposed to small and bitchy. Yes. <laughs> I just want to see y'all drag a body up to him. He's like, it's only mostly dead. <laughs> mostly dead means partially alive, but then Goris eats him. <laughs> <laughs> there, I solved your problem. So I have a question for everyone. What's everyone's thoughts on the fact that snow is now in the Mojave? <laughs> Obviously, it's Christmas. Obviously, it's snow obviously. happens at Christmas. It's that is the law. Christmas. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it's fine. I'm sure nothing bad could possibly be happening that would cause it to snow in the Mojave. 
I think honestly, the legitimate answer th- for that is that as soon as Carter sits down and thinks about it, he's going to go, this is just really not right and very bad on multiple levels, being a high science type of person. But it's not something that popped into his head immediately because it's ooh pretty. <laughs> like that yeah unfortunately uh, i oh go ahead no go ahead uh irish doesn't have the 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 ooh pretty reaction she's just like okay so nuclear winter doesn't set in like this what's going on especially <laughs> not hundreds of years after the bombs exactly. dropped exactly my first thought when um solomon started describing the um the the white flakes coming down was actually that it was like soot from something burning from like from an explosion um because you always hear about stories where like um massive fires will happen or whatever and people will like look up and kids will think that it's think that it's snowing because they look up and all they see is like white stuff falling from the sky yeah um, that's it turns what out I that it's it actually turns out that it's ash and i got real nervous and then you said that it, it said that it hits her palm and 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 melted and i went oh that's worse i yeah. i didn't i didn't think that could happen that's worse <laughs> yeah i would have been way more okay if it was like volcanic ash or something no no it's snow in the middle of the desert in august <laughs> this can only go well yeah this is only a good thing blame the think tank i will I feel like that's just Iris's modus operandi is to blame the think tank. Uh, I mean, for the things that have been happening recently, especially. Yeah. Everything is their fault. Generally, yeah. it's blame the Institute, but now, right now it's blame the think tank. <laughs> I mean, they're clearly working together. Yeah, kind of. Right. Any other questions? No. Okay. Uh, in that case, we're going to go ahead and wrap up here. Uh, thank you for listening. These episodes are dropped Thursdays at noon for our $5 and up tiers on Patreon. They're released to the public one month after that. So if you want to keep up with them, please think about subscribing so that you can be up to date with your talk news for Hallowed Haven Studios. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye.